question. In some ways, Gail, I assume, is the continuation of what mm -hmm. we heard upstairs. Uh, it's, it's a great pleasure to, um, to introduce uh, Dr. Gail Fisher Stewart. And I have the pleasure of saying that uh, she is my former student. Um, I was the associate dean of Virginia and was the, the director of the evening school. Um, and uh, Gail was a participant in the evening school, and she reminds me that I actually handed her her certificate, her program, her, her diploma for the evening school. So, mm -hmm. so this is a kind of reunion. Yes. <laughs> uh, Gail is, uh, as as you know, she is an extraordinary person in so many ways. She now holds a doctorate in political science. From the University of Maryland, but uh, that follows, uh, uh, as well as a Master of Theological Studies from Wesley Theological Seminary, a real Maryland, D.C. person. There you go. Um, uh, she um, uh, had a 20-year career as a police officer in the D.C. Metropolitan Police Department, and um, has now established the Center for the Study of Faith and Justice, um, for which she received the 2016 Director's Award given by the Episcopal Evangelical Society, of which I am proud to be the Vice President. <laughs> Can I mention the next thing that's happening for you? Is that not a secret at, in Hamilton, New York? Oh, no, it's not a secret. I'm, I, as, a, <laughs> as a former trustee of Colgate University, um, uh, I am delighted to uh, announce that um, that Gail is, um, in, a, in a couple of weeks, going to give the baccalaureate address at Colgate, where she will be given an honorary doctorate. So, <laughs> I am so pleased to know this person, and I'm so glad, Gail, that you are willing to come. Ah, thank so you. Please welcome Gail Fisher. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. It is indeed an honor and a pleasure to be here. And when uh, Roger was talking about last days upstairs, I thought he had a little bit more information than the rest of us <laughs> had. Like, I, I need to do this quickly because. We might not be here by 5 o'clock. Um, but I want to thank Roger for his invitation to come and, and speak. Uh, there's a lot going on in this country and the world and the Church of Christ and all its forms. And we have our work cut out for us. And what would it be like? What would it be like for this country and the world if, if every church that calls itself Christian actually followed Jesus? In seminary, we go, that would preach. <laughs> if all the churches that call themselves Christian would actually take up the cross of Jesus. And so I have a reading from the Gospel of Mark. As you go, proclaim the good news. The kingdom of heaven has come near. Cure the sick, raise the dead, cleanse the lepers, cast out demons. You have received without payment, give without payment. And then, since this is about bending towards justice from Martin Luther King Jr., when our days become dreary with low-hanging clouds of despair and when our nights become darker than a thousand midnights, let us remember that there is a creative force in this universe, working to pull down the gigantic mountains of evil, a power that is able to make a way out of no way and transform dark yesterdays into bright tomorrows. Let us realize the arc of the moral universe is long, but it bends toward justice. And then from former president, Barack Obama, who was speaking yesterday, day before yesterday, he says, the only thing I'm absolutely, absolutely convinced of is this. Yes, we confront a whole range of challenges from economic inequality and lack of opportunity to the criminal justice system, to climate change, to issues related to violence. All those promise, uh, problems are serious, they're daunting but they're not insolvable. What is preventing us from tackling them and making more progress really has to do with our politics and our civic life. We are able to do, to change the world, to continue to feed the seeds that the sower of the gospel has planted. 
The question is whether or not we want to. Whether or not we want to. And I'd like for you, to, as I'm speaking, to think about whether or not you, you know, uh, if you were are still in seminary, out of seminary, but think about that seminary experience and how these words might affect you. Because some of you are ordained and others are called to be ordained. And I'm not leaving out those whose vocation is not ordained clergy. But something happens to you when you are ordained and that something is different for each person. For me, it came the first time I presided at the Eucharist. When I held the host aloft at the fraction and broke it. And when I broke it, I was sent to a place I was not prepared to deal with. Because at that moment, I questioned, I was thinking, How do we as God's people continue to fracture the body of Christ, to break the body of Christ through hatred and division, even in the church? And this is totally different than the perspective I heard in seminary that Christ's body was broken for us. Where I was transported, it was like, his body is broken by us. And how many times do we continue to do that? And so this afternoon, I'd like to deal with that division, the continued fracturing of the body of Christ. And I'd like to trouble the waters a little bit. You know, in the spiritual wade in the water, we sing God's going to trouble the waters. Because things are not the way God wants them for God's creation and God's people. And while I make no claims on being close to knowing the mind of God, I believe that God wants God's people to trouble the waters when things here on earth don't measure up to what God wants them to be. When things are not quite bending toward justice, when walls are being built, constructed, and maintained that harm God's people. The refrain, God's going to trouble the waters, comes from the Gospel of John, the fifth chapter, and it is about those who come to the pool at the sheep gate. The scripture says later Jesus went to Jerusalem for another Jewish festival and the city near the sheep gate was the pool with five porches and its name in Hebrew was Bethesda. Many sick, blind, lame and crippled people were lying close to the pool. Beside the pool was a man who had been sick for 38 years. When Jesus saw the man and realized that he had been crippled for a long time, he asked them, do you want to be healed? And as we hear this today, who are the people at today's sheep gate in the margins waiting for the waters of God's justice to be stirred so they can be made whole, both in body and in soul? Who are those when opportunities are created, are pushed to the rear, overlooked, disregarded, just plain out ignored? Who are those who are not seen as fully human and worthy of respect? Yet Jesus, the healer, the reconciler, is there at the gate in the margins and asks, do you want to be healed? Who does not want to be healed, to be made whole? Troubling the waters propels us to tear down whatever obstacles, walls there are that keeps God's people from being who God calls them and wants them to be. A seminary is a time of discovery, but that discovery can shake your world. And one of my favorite spirituals was Joshua fought the battle at Jericho. or As I heard in my grandmother's Methodist church, Joshua fit the battle and the walls come tumbling down. And we know in the book of Joshua that Joshua was told by the Lord to circle the city. Right. Once for six days, but on the seventh day, you're going to circle it seven times. And then the trumpets would shout and the people would shout and the walls would come tumbling down. And then I went to seminary. <laughs> and I had a professor who was an archaeological theologian who said, well, we're not even sure whether or not there was a battle or whether there were not even walls that came tumbling down. You know, but I had heard it, right? 
I had heard it in Sunday school. I heard it preached. I read it in the Bible. But even if the story is a myth, the bands, you know, with the wall that all too many people want built to keep people out of this country, the bans on people entering this country, the divisions that continue to separate us as a people who live and work in America, the denominationalism that divides, that fractures the people of God, the body of Christ, the church, the side-eyed trend to look unfavorably on people who don't think like us, worship like us, believe like us who do not fit the stereotype of what it is to be American. The militarism that threatens our very existence on this earth. Perhaps we can understand a song that was lifted up by the enslaved and those who followed after emancipation, who were looking for the walls of hatred and division to be destroyed, to come tumbling down on earth, right here, right now. Bexley Seabury, a 21st century seminary beyond the walls, preparing people to be engaged in God's mission to the world. I mean, what does that look like in a world that seems poised on the brink of self-destruction? What does that look like? I mean, your, the, your 19th century founders pushed the envelope, and several times since then, the envelope was again pushed to form the institution that exists today. And the folks that will come here to seminary will leave these walls, these walls that provided a nurturing environment, and they will minister in a country that wants at times the man that God bless it, but fails on so many accounts to do as God requires. A seminary is a place to learn, to discern, and to push, to challenge, to be limber, to be flexible and open enough to bend towards justice. And while the canon is closed, and I had an argument with my professor, and I'm going like, well, if God is still speaking, why is the canon closed? Can't we just open it back up? Can't there be a new New Testament or something? And so they would just look at me like, later. Like, when do you graduate? You know? But because the canon is closed, uh, there are times when we need conversation partners that can help us understand what God is still saying to us. Uh, because, you know, we have people who are dying for a lack of food in a country that where there's plenty of food, in a world where there's plenty of food. Um, we have people dying at the hands of those who have sworn to serve and protect God's people. A world in which people are more spiritual than religious and where many of our churches are dying on the vine, where our young people would rather attend the church of Starbucks than enter a sanctuary on Sunday morning. And so while the canon is closed, my apocryphal friends, because I got to go to the apocrypha, because there's a whole lot of stuff in there that didn't make it into canon, so I'm going to add some more folks to the apocrypha. My apocryphal friends for this, this journey today are the Reverend Dr. Kelly Brown Douglas, who wrote Stand Your Ground, Black Bodies and the Justice of God. Dr. Kenyatta Gilbert, who wrote A Pursued Justice, Black Preaching from the Great Migration to Civil Rights. The Reverend Dr. Michael Battle, whose book is Heaven and Earth, God's Call to Community in the Book of Revelation. Dr. Aubrey M. Hendricks, the universe bends toward justice, radical reflections on the Bible, the church, and the body politic. And Dr. Reggie Williams, Bonhoeffer, Bonhoeffer's Black Jesus, Harlem Renaissance Theology, and an Ethic of Resistance. These theologians and others help break open the gospel of Jesus so that it is read as Obery Hendricks writes from below that the Gospels must be understood from the perspective of those who were under the domination of the religious, political, and military elite. That those who study and then go on to tell somebody, as Mary did on the morning she found the empty tomb, must do so through the interpretive lenses and angles of vision of class and culture that will allow the fullness of the events and occurrences, thoughts, and sentiments the evangelists recounted to be fully appreciated, that the love we find in the Gospels is not the gushy, 
candy laden, flower bringing, heart fluttering love, but a love that is self-sacrificing and other oriented, a love that is canonic, poured out for the other. Through these class and culturally focused lenses, as we read, study, hear the word, the meaning of scripture changes depending on what is going on in our lives and society. And some parts might not be lifted up as often or as well as others. In the Gospel of John, the 18th chapter, Jesus is arrested. Peter denies him three times. Jesus goes before the chief priest. There's a trial before Pilate. Then we're in chapter 19 with the crucifixion and burial. And then chapter 20 with the resurrection. But let's do a close reading, a reading from below, a reading from the perspective of black and brown bodies who tend to have negative interactions with the police. From the perspective of black and brown parents who fear for the lives of their black sons. And so let's do a close reading, a close hearing of this portion of scripture as Jesus is questioned by the high priest. The high priest questioned Jesus about his followers and his teachings. But Jesus told him, I've spoken freely in front of everyone. And I have always taught in our meeting places and in the temple where all of our people come together I have not said anything in secret. Why are you questioning me? Why did you stop me? Why don't you ask the people who heard me? Why don't you talk to the people who are filming this? They know what I have said. They know I didn't do anything. As soon as Jesus said this, one of the temple police hit him and said, that's no way to talk to the high priest. Oh, you don't know your place, do you? Jesus answered, if I have done something wrong, say so. If I've broken the law, tell me what I've broken. If not, why did you hit me? Why are you abusing me? Jesus was still tied up, handcuffed. As we look at Jesus's encounter with the justice system of his day, we read it in light of the fact of the Massachusetts Supreme Court that ruled that a black man who runs from the police shouldn't necessarily be considered suspicious and merely might be trying to avoid the recurring indignity of being racially profiled. In our rush to get to the end of the story, to get to the hope of the third day, we can easily overlook that Jesus is a victim of police excessive force, caught up in an unjust justice system. This portion of scripture provides an entree for the church to critique the justice system of today and to fully engage in police reform to understand that American policing was never about crime prevention, crime control as we know it. Rather, policing was to protect the property interest of the industrial elite in the North and the slaveholding plantocracy in the South, whose earthly interests were being upheld when Jesus stood in front of the high priest. Pilate said he could find this man guilty of nothing and still he was executed. How many black and brown bodies are on death row? Guilty of nothing. How many are gonna be killed because the expiration date on the drugs is coming up? How many have died to feed the bloodlust of a society that criminalizes black and brown bodies from the womb. The Reverend Dr. Kelly Brown Douglas offers that the black body was never meant to be free in this country. Is there a word from the Lord? What does the good news mean in a world that sometimes seems that if it has lost its very mind, where nations play chicken with bombs, where people Facebook live murder and rape where violence of all kinds seems to make money and grab the purient attention of the public, where sex trafficking can be the business model of the day, where women are viewed as sexual objects to be harassed and groped, and where children go to bed hungry 
and where the violent deaths of our LGBTQIA plus family members are but a footnote on the nightly news. Is there a word from the Lord beyond the walls bending toward justice? What does bending toward justice look like? How much pain is actually involved? Is there desire for truth and reconciliation begun and led by the church with the church either confessing or having a renewal of confession of its own sins of separation of wall building? Those who've been in seminary, those who are currently here in seminary, have spent their time in this womb of theological knowledge, nourished by the amniotic, the life-giving waters of the voices of the ages and the voices of the present who challenge them and us to live a more perfect way in a world that seems to believe, as I saw on a bumper sticker, he who dies with the most toys wins. Obviously, it doesn't realize you can't get all that in the casket. Okay. Where walls real and spiritual follow the mantra of the last line of the poem, Mending Fences by Robert Frost. Good fences make good neighbors. In the poem, two characters have different ideas about exactly what makes a good neighbor. One neighbor is preoccupied with mending the fence, replacing the stones that fall out each and every year. The narrator offers that the very act of mending the wall seems to be against nature. That nature understands that walls and fences do not foster good relationships, so every year the wall throws out stones trying to get rid of the wall. Every year nature breaks down the wall and every year human beings come to build the wall back up, not realizing that perhaps they need to see what nature, perhaps God, is trying to do. The narrator questions why there's a need to maintain individuality and personal identity as opposed to being in community, in relationship with each other. As the narrator continues to question the other farmer, the only answer that is returned is, Good fences make good neighbors. And yet we are called to love our neighbors as ourselves. And fences, walls, get in the way of that relationship. Are such borders necessary to, ma to maintain relationships between people, particularly God's people? You who come here are to make Christ real in a world where a two-year-old child must break down walls of division. A mother promised her daughter that she could buy a toy if she successfully completed potty training. And so the daughter did that. And the mother took the two-year-old to Target to buy a toy. And so the daughter saw a doll that reflected her. And the mother and the daughter went to the cashier, and the cashier said, that doll doesn't look like you. Don't you want a doll that looks like you? And this two-year-old, the mother was getting ready to say something, but this two-year-old, in all of her infinite wisdom, she said, she's a pretty girl, I'm a pretty girl. She has pretty hair, I have pretty hair. She's a doctor, I'm a doctor. See her stethoscope? And so the mother, my mother said that the daughter had learned the word stethoscope by watching a cartoon series, Doc McStuffins, that features a young African-American girl as a doctor. And so you had this cashier who wanted this little girl to see something else. And she's saying, no, I, I identify with this doll. Now the thing is, the little girl's white. The doll she selected was black. But the cashier wanted her to put down the black doll and go get a white doll because the white doll looked more like her. And so those who, who come here will leave these walls and go on to lay or ordain ministry or continue to seek answers to the questions on their hearts. And everyone who leaves here will find themselves in a world that Michael Battle lets us know is different than the earth. God created. 
They will find themselves in a world that Paul warns to be in, but not of a world that is not the earth created by God, but a world created by human beings who believe like Pharaoh and Caesar that they are God. Have you ever had a conversation with someone about the gospel and what we're supposed to do? And they say, yes, but you know, we're in the real world. And you want to go, what world are you really in? That there's this, you know, it's like God's world over here. And then there's a real world over here. A real world where certain people are not worthy. Some are not even viewed as being human. James Baldwin, in critiquing a system that denigrated blacks, asked in the documentary, I am not your Negro. How many of you have seen the documentary? Oh, all of y'all got to see that. That's homework assignment to go see I am not your Negro. There is also a study book for it in case you want to do small group sessions. But he says in, in this documentary, he says, why is it necessary to have a nigger in the first place? Because I am not a nigger. I'm a man. But if you think I'm a nigger, it's because you need it. And you need to find out why. But that is a world to which all too many aspire. One in which all of the isms and phobias serve to create second, third, and fourth class citizens where unfortunately those with money are seen as more worthy than those without, even if those with money contribute little or nothing to the betterment of God's people. That is the world that holds sway. That is the world that promises that you can be anything you want, have anything your heart desires, that you are the master of your fate and have no responsibility toward your neighbor. This is a world in which God is seen as a cosmic bellhop, a magician who showers blessings for the asking, and when that fulfilling request is put up on a shelf somewhere out there, and please don't bother me until I have another request for you. This is the world in which Jesus warned the disciples, see, I am sending you out like sheep in the midst of wolves, and we need to ask those who are leaving our seminaries, can you handle that? I mean, there are times when I wish that I had the gift of being able to speak parallel conversations because there are many people who get it, who actually understand it, who demonstrate the kingdom of God, who are doing God's work, who are breaking down the walls that keep God's people from being all they are called to be. However, there is much work still to be done. Jesus said the kingdom of God is like this, and he went on to explain he did not say the kingdom of God is like this kind of sort of maybe if you get around to it sometime over there, maybe we'll just think about it. I mean, yes, the glass is half full, but it is also half empty and we are called to continue Christ's work and mission. We are called to fill that glass up to the top. And so the question asked by the Reverend Dr. Michael Battle is how do we resist? the powers and principalities that keep making us turn in the wrong direction away from God. Why can't we have heaven on earth? Isn't that what we pray in the Lord's prayer? Right? Yeah? Are you sure? <laughs> kind of play the tape. <laughs> yeah, it's right there. Okay. You know, but first, how do we resist the idols that separate us from God? And first we have to... Uh, help people understand that heaven is not separated from earth because heaven is wherever God is. And that we who are called have been called to be an agent of heaven on earth. That if we follow Christ, we follow a Christ who is the perfect embodiment of God's kingdom because when God took human form and came to earth to dwell among us, the wall between heaven and earth was shattered. And in shattering that wall in Jesus, there are no divisions, there are no exclusions. Race, gender, politics, sex, or power do not divide us. We are able to see that God has made us so interdependent, so connected to each other, that we all reflect the image of God. 
we reflect the Imago Dei. When we look at each other, we see God. No longer can the poor, the homeless, the imprisoned be told not to worry about what happens on earth, that things will be better in heaven. Because as we read in Matthew, the 10th chapter, Jesus says the kingdom of God has come near because Jesus walked the earth. The wall between heaven and earth was shattered. And this Jesus didn't comply with the authorities who did not have the interests of God's people at heart. This Jesus resisted unjust systems that perpetuated violence on God's people. And if we follow Jesus, we are called to do the same, to confront systemic evil, to be arrested like Reverend King and Reverend Tracy Blackman and others yesterday in Washington, D.C., that if we are to be engaged in the politics of Jesus, as Hendricks writes, we will scrutinize every political policy and program by this standard. Is it based on the command to love your neighbor as yourself? Does it treat God's people and their needs as holy? And so our challenge is to figure out how to engage people and what battle calls the theology of proximity, where we understand that heaven on earth is where our deep gladness meets the world's deep hunger. What makes us truly happy intersects with the world's greatest need and how God wants us to meet that need. And if we help people to truly follow Jesus, we realize that we cannot be happy knowing that there are others who are not happy. Last week, there was a conference here sponsored by the bishops against gun violence. It's called the Unholy Trinity, Intersection of Racism, Poverty, and Gun Violence. And Reverend uh, Melanie Mullen, the Director of Reconciliation, Justice, and Creation, uh, Creation Care for the Episcopal Church, tweeted, you can't love your neighbor while quietly watching them drink lead-contaminated water. We need to guard against human constructed heavens in which one is personally joyful while others are in hell. And heaven cannot become a reality as long as anyone is suffering. As we hear the words of the enslaved in Joshua fit the battle, those who held God's people in bondage did not see how their behavior contradicted finding God's presence. And the walls had to come tumbling down. Scripture says, then the king will say to those on his right, my father has blessed you. Come and receive the kingdom that was prepared for you before the world was created. When I was hungry, you gave me something to eat. And when I was thirsty, you gave me something to drink. When I was a stranger, you welcomed me. And when I was naked, you gave me clothes to wear. When I was sick, you took care of me. And when I was in jail, you visited me. Racism, sexism, classism, homophobia, transform, uh, transphobia, and the list goes on are all power dynamics that say, I have no need for you as a mutual human being. I have no need for you. I don't have to see you as being worthy of respect. And once people become viewed as not like us, it is a short jump to mass incarceration. It is a short jump to annihilation and extermination. As we see families broken apart, people who have come to this country for a better life come to this country that is God's. As parents are being stripped away from their children and deported because human, believe, human beings believe that dominion over the earth means domination and that stewardship we must remember the auction block, the slave traders, the slave pens, the slave cockles. When children were ripped from the arms of their parents, when parents were sold away from their children, when spouses were separated, never to see each other again because the black family structure did not matter because they were not human families. They did not reflect the image of God and so they could be ripped apart Families could be destroyed. Only certain families mattered. But then let us not forget the indigenous families stripped of personhood, children forcefully taken from parents. The mantra was, kill the Indian, save the man taken off to Indian schools and forced to assimilate, to give up their culture, to give up their language, to become 
white. Their family structure did not matter either. It wasn't American, it was not white. But we must remember that to assimilate a part of you, a part of what God has created, has to be destroyed. It has to be destroyed and you become something other than yourself and you begin to live a lie. As Barack Obama stated, our call is to live a communal existence, to be community, to be Martin Luther King's beloved community in which we only know the truth of who we are through the interaction of others. King said, I cannot be all I can be if you are not all you can be. I need someone else to know myself. Therefore, police officers come to know who they truly are through those who are unjustly treated, but they want to be unjustly treated. Those whose lives have been changed forever, affected through illegal arrests for driving while black, walking while black, breathing while black, and ultimately dying while black that police officers know themselves through the body of Michael Brown that laid in the street in the hot August sun for four hours like a piece of trash, a nobody, a nothing, as Mark Lamont Hill writes. And the current occupant of the White House knows himself through those he wants to ban from coming to this country and those he calls murderers, rapists, and bad hombres. Would he like to be banned? called a murderer, a rapist, a bi hombre. And ministers of the word know themselves through our LGBTQIA plus family who are demonized in all too many churches. And Bill O'Reilly and the other men come to know themselves through the women they see as property to be used and exploited for their personal pleasure. Would they like to be treated the very same way? As Paul admonishes, the body of Christ, the church cannot flee from this world, and we are called to change the world through nonviolent resistance to evil powers and principalities. And our own Bishop Curry has said, we are made by love, for love, to be love, and to love. And our mission is to love this world and ourselves into the very dream of God. We are called to promote a Christian spirituality of reconciliation. And so where does it begin? How do we do this? People graduate from seminary and go out and go like, really? Really? Whatever our call, we must all be prophetic. It is not enough to be non-racist or non-sexist or non-homophobic or non-transphobic. We must be anti-racist, anti-sexist, anti-homophobic, anti, -homophobic, anti which means that it's beyond myself. I'm okay because I love everybody. But we are called to say, to do that whenever we see other things that hurt people, that we speak out, that we be prophetic. And as Hendricks has written by prophetic, he means the mode of behavior modeled by classical biblical prophets such as Jeremiah, Isaiah, Micah, and Amos, who boldly and publicly create, critique the oppressive and exploitive behaviors of rulers and ruling classes in their perspectives. And so how, how do we do this? How, how do we help somebody? Sometimes we need a roadmap. And for an example, I'm going to go to the black church because the black church was formed out of oppression. The black church was formed because the church did not want certain of God's people. In 1931, Dietrich Bonhoeffer came here on a Sloan Fellowship and he affiliated with Abyssinian Black Baptist Church in New York. And these are his own words. These are his own words. He said that he visited white churches where he found Christ. But when he visited black church, he found everybody gets an A. He said he found the Jesus that was in the margins. He found the Jesus that said, okay, government, if you're not going to do anything for the people, then my body is going to take up that mantle and do 
something. And so he saw churches, work with churches that said, come here. You know, we're going to throw a theological blanket around you and whatever you need. You need a job, we got it. You need education, you got it. You need food, you got it. You need a loan, you got it. We're going to take up the slack of a government that doesn't want you. And so he said that because of that, that experience here, that he had to go back to Germany when Hitler was acting stupid. Although his American friends and German friends said, no, you need to stay here. He said, I can't do that because Jesus would be over in Germany. Jesus would be with those suffering the Holocaust. And of course, we know that he went back and he lost his life. But he says, what's that phrase he uses? Starts with a C H E A P. Cheap grace. A lot of folks want the easy grace. I profess that I believe in you. I'm okay. He said, no, that's not going to get it. You got to have that costly grace. That when Christ calls, and we have to remember when he was writing, when Christ calls a man, he calls him, he bids him come and die. That if you're not willing to sacrifice all, as Jesus did for us on the cross, then don't talk about grace. Don't talk about being saved. Don't talk about that you are following Christ. And so as we come here, we have this, this whole concept that Daniel Berrigan said about prophets and the poor. He says, you know, our, our poor lets us know who we are and our prophets let us know who we can be. So we hide our poor and kill our prophets. Being a prophet is, is, is difficult, is difficult, is difficult. And so Bonhoeffer learned an other-centered rather than a self-centered theology. And he realized through working with Adam Clayton Powell Sr. that you had to go back to the Acts 2 church where people came together and contributed all they had. And then it was distributed to anybody as they had need. So every time we leave a worship experience, we should be transformed to go out and do something to change the world. Uh, but, you know, I have to... Uh, I have to make a confession. I lifted up the black church, but the black church ain't perfect. Just like the church ain't perfect. Amen. I got it. Okay. Amen. Right? Just like the church was co-opted by the empire once Christianity became legal, the black church became co-opted once we thought the civil rights struggle had been won. But we realized that that was just a lull in the battle. And so you know, we all need to take up that mantle. You know, so prophetic preaching critiques the church. It says where the church is doing good and it says where the church is doing bad. But when you do that, I can tell you what's going to happen because a colleague of mine came and I tried that. <laughs> I tried that and folks came up to me and said, we don't want to hear none of that radical stuff. We come to church and maybe feel good. I want to feel good when I leave here. Don't, don't, talk, don't, don't preach that radical stuff. But we have to do it. We have to do it. We have to have a church that lifts up what the epistle of James offers, that faith without works is dead. And that King said, only a dry as dust religion prompts a minister to extol the glories of heaven while ignoring the social conditions that cause people and earthly hell. That's our role. I mean, God has given us earth to practice heaven. God came to earth and walked among us to show us the way, the way to live in community, to care for each other. Battle's theology of proximity is, is King's vision of the beloved communion, community, a vision for peace, justice, and mutual care for each other in the world. You know, Jesus taught through his parables that the kingdom of heaven is realized through community. I mean, he was, you know, he was walking around. He said, follow me, follow me. Like, I need you. You know, follow me, follow me. He knew he couldn't do it by himself, really. So we got to do this in community. And so we have to form communities where people are visionary, 
who can actually see how the world can be and then know that it's going to be tough getting there, but we can get there. Too many people are waiting for Jesus to come back. But I saw this T-shirt. Anybody got any holy water just in case? I need somebody to absolve me. It says, Jesus is coming back and he's pissed. <laughs> you know, we need visionaries because without a vision, the people shall perish. And today it just might be through self-destruction. King's words ring clear, the difficult days ahead. But we are a people of hope. The powers and principalities that thought they had sealed hope in the tomb were shocked. When on the third day, Mary went and the death clothes were left. Mary thought that Jesus was a gardener until he called her by name. And then he said, you go and you tell somebody what you saw here. Go and tell somebody that the world has been changed forever, that hate and division will not win, that the walls that separate God from God's people and each other will be torn down. And the question is, if not us, who? If not now, when? Amen.